Gravitational waves are ripples in space-time that can warp the very fabric of space itself, and they can stretch and warp everything they pass through, including you, me, and even the Earth itself. The stretching caused by these gravitational waves is incredibly small, often smaller than the diameter of a proton. This means that we need incredibly sensitive and incredibly big detectors on Earth to actually see them. These huge detectors can be pretty hard to understand, so let's take one, shrink it down to a tabletop size and see how they really work. Gravitational wave detectors are examples of instruments called interferometers, and they use an intricate setup of lasers and long vacuum tunnels to achieve the unimaginable sensitivity needed to actually see these gravitational waves. For example, the LIGO gravitational wave detectors in Washington State and Louisiana in the USA have an L-shaped setup, and each so-called arm of LIGO is four kilometers long. These huge detectors are able to see the incredibly small stretching and warping of gravitational waves produced by merging black holes and merging neutron stars. These waves stretch an arm of LIGO by about 1 10,000th the width of a proton, and according to the LIGO website, this is equivalent to measuring the distance to the nearest star, which is 4.2 light years away, to a precision smaller than the width of a human hair. To achieve this insane precision, the LIGO arms need to be the four kilometers long that they are. But for me, it's kind of hard to picture what exactly they're doing when they're so big. Instead, let's take a look at this. It's a tabletop interferometer that works pretty much exactly the same way as the huge LIGO detectors. Let's head over to the demo table and take a closer look at this thing. I'm really excited because these things are so cool. Here I have my laser. It's a lot smaller than the LIGO laser, but it'll work for this demo. We also have a very high-tech way of keeping it on without having to hold the button the whole time. It's a clothes peg. You can see that my very small interferometer doesn't have any enclosed tunnels or arms like LIGO does, but the laser path is the same, it's just out here in the open. If I now turn on a smoke machine and we lose these lights, we can actually see the path that the laser takes. The light leaves the laser and the first thing it hits is a beam splitter. Here, it's basically just a piece of glass or plastic that's a bit see-through and a bit reflective to the laser. This means that about half the light goes straight through it, and the other half is reflected at a right angle. These two paths correspond to the two arms of LIGO, but the arms we have here are only about 6 centimeters long. So, the laser is emitted, it passes through the beam splitter, half goes up one arm and half goes up the other arm. At the end of each arm is a mirror, and this simply reflects the laser back the way it came. Actually, LIGO itself is even more extreme, because the laser beam actually reflects up and down the arms about 300 times before coming out at the next stage. This is to both simulate a much longer arm and to increase the amplitude of the laser so that it's more powerful. Our little one doesn't do that, but that's okay. It's still trying its best. The two beams then recombine at the beam splitter and the laser comes out the other side here. And if we stick a piece of paper here, we see the output of the interferometer, a circle of light. If you look carefully, however, you'll see that it isn't a solid circle of laser light, but rather it has quite an intricate and specific pattern in it. This is called an interference pattern, and it's the most important part of the system. You see, if I pull or tap slightly on one of the arms of the detector, that is, I tap on one of the mirrors, I'm very slightly changing the length of the arm, and therefore changing the distance that the light travels down that arm. As I do this, take a look at the interference pattern on the piece of paper. You can see it changing and moving. Once I'm confident that I've removed everything else that could possibly be moving the arms, like seismic noise from the ground and even vibrations from the power source of the detector, plus much more, then eventually I can say that the only possible thing moving the arms is a gravitational wave passing through the detector. So at that point, if I see the interference pattern moving and shifting, it must be a gravitational wave, and we've successfully detected one. It's super difficult to actually get to this point, especially when you're doing it with the 4km arms like LIGO does, or even the future space mission LISA, which will actually have arms that are a few million kilometers long. There are loads of very difficult sources of noise that need to be removed, and it's super hard to do it. For example, the LIGO laser beam is designed to be spread out over about 6 centimeters on the mirrors in LIGO, this avoids the mirror heating up too much and causing thermal fluctuations on the surface. That's how insanely sensitive these things are. The surfaces of those mirrors are perfectly designed to reflect the exact wavelength of light that LIGO uses, and it absorbs almost none of the photons that hit it. 
The mirrors also need to be hanging perfectly still when there's no grav waves. And the only way the mirrors are attached to anything else is by glass fibers that are welded directly to the mirrors. And they're made of the exact same material as the mirror because any other material being attached to them would introduce resonances and cause noise in the detector. LIGO is sometimes called the most precise ruler in the world. Ruler for sizes, not for countries. So this is how the interferometers work, but let's now talk about why this works. It's all due to the fact that light can be thought of as a wave. And just like waves in water, light waves can interfere with each other and themselves, and they give us these interference patterns that are measured on the paper. The wave of laser light has peaks and troughs. If you have two waves, they can combine in a process we call interference. And if the peak of one wave overlaps with the trough of another, the waves cancel out and we see no light. If two peaks or two troughs overlap, then we see very bright light. In the LIGO detector, assuming no grav waves are present, the arm lengths are precisely known and controlled so that the waves of laser light are always perfectly out of phase with each other. This means that no light hits the detector, which in LIGO is more sophisticated than the piece of paper we have here, but it's in the same place as it is here. However, when a gravitational wave passes through the detector, the length of one or both arms changes, meaning the waves no longer combine at the beam splitter perfectly out of phase, and so the waves don't cancel, and light appears in the detector. As the length changes with the wave, the light will flicker on and off. This is exactly how grav waves are detected in LIGO. So in LIGO, they're used to seeing nothing at all, and when they see a flash of light on their detector, that's the gravitational wave. For our tabletop detector, we see the interference pattern changing. But if you pick one spot on the paper that's initially dark, and then the pattern shifts to light it up, that's exactly what LIGO does. It sees light appearing, and that's our grav wave. In LIGO, the scientists then record the patterns they see, and they can use some impressive analysis and computer code to understand what type of event caused the gravitational wave they've seen. It might be two black holes merging, two neutron stars merging, or even a black hole merging with a neutron star. Whatever it was, it will have been an incredible event with an incredible amount of energy being released, enough to literally warp the fabric of space. I hope you found this interesting and it made some sense, or you at least enjoyed seeing some cool lasers bouncing off mirrors. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below and subscribe if you enjoyed. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.